Welcome to the Extra Mile Podcast for bar exam takers. There are no traffic jams along the extra mile when you're studying for your bar exam. And now, your host, Jackson Mummy, owner of the Celebration Bar Review. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 252 of the Extra Mile Podcast for bar exam takers. This is your host, Jackson Mummy. Hope everybody had a wonderful Mother's Day weekend and good study weekend. I know we are coming up in just a few days after this episode releases to California bar results from February of 2019. We had a few states release results right before the weekend. We'll get to those in just a minute. Uh, But there's a lot going on right now. we got a lot of people getting ready for their July exams. We're about 80, 85 days until that date. So there is a lot happening. So I really appreciate that you're taking time out of your busy day to join us on the podcast. And I also want to thank those of you that have been sending me notes uh, about particular episodes that we've done and some of the series that we've done and the impact that it's made on you. I appreciate hearing that. It's terrific feedback for me. And I'm glad that we could provide content that's really useful to you. So if you've been a loyal listener, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I know that your time is valuable. And if you're new to the podcast, welcome. We're glad to have you here. I come to you every week on Wednesdays, typically, uh, to talk about all things bar exam related. We'll do some bonus episodes from time to time when results come out. So our next bonus episode will be after the California results come out. They'll be released late on Friday, uh, this coming uh, week of May 17th. And so I would expect in the next week, right after that, we'll do a bonus episode. Now, to make sure you don't miss that, you want to subscribe to the podcast in Apple iTunes or Spotify or iHeartRadio, and we'll also let you know via email uh, when that's coming out. We also provide these podcasts in video form if you'd rather watch, and you can always do that by just going to celebrationbarreview.com and then forward slash and enter the episode number. This is episode 252. So if you'd like to watch today's episode, go to celebrationbarreview.com forward slash 252. Well, in today's episode, we're going to be talking to a successful Florida bar exam taker. Florida results came out a few weeks ago, and we've got some great interviews lined up with people that were successful on that exam. But I really wanted to lead off with uh, the story that we're going to share today. It it comes from a licensed Mississippi attorney who has been in practice for 35 years, came down to Florida to sit for the bar exam, passed on his first try with a terrific score, really did a great job of, of working. And so often the the stories that I tell in these podcasts are people that overcame failure to be successful. But in Brian's case, it was more a matter of dealing with uh, the loss of his brother uh, tragically from cancer um, and uh, just the challenges of restarting uh, the, the process of studying after so many years as a successful attorney. In fact, he's so successful, I can't say it. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, but Brian was a terrific student. He integrated uh, our writing style. He used a form of mind mapping that we're going to talk about. I think you're going to really be impressed with what he did. And he had great scores on the bar exam. So I hope you'll stick around for that interview. Now, before we hop to the interview, um, I just want to remind you that, as always, our podcast is brought to you by our free training webinar. It's called Do Something Different make the next bar exam your last bar exam. Now this webinar will take you step by step through the four steps that successful bar students like Brian follow in order to pass their exams. We're gonna show you what to do every step of the way. We're gonna share some case studies with you uh, so that you can hear from people who were successful in their exams from around the country and a variety of backgrounds and a variety of circumstances. And we're gonna just give you the information that you need to get underway and to have the confidence to do something different. Now, this webinar is completely free, and it'll be held on Thursday at 7 p.m. To register, all you have to do is click on the button on the show notes, either here on the video or in the audio form, or you can go to celebrationbarreview.com forward slash webinar. So that's celebrationbarreview.com forward slash webinar. Register for uh, Thursday at 7 p.m., and then show up uh, and prepare yourself to find out what you have to do differently in order to make the next bar exam your last bar exam. Now, I told you that uh, some bar results have been released this year or this week, and uh, the bar examiners are getting uh, 
I think, a bit more cagey about it. Maybe they're learning from the uh, politicians in Washington, but I found that they like to release their results on Friday afternoon so that there can't be a whole lot of press or publicity over the weekend about it. And so as a result, I don't have any statistics to give you, but I can tell you that at the end of last week, uh, four fairly large states uh, released results. The biggest of them was New Jersey, which is UBE. Michigan, which is not a UBE state, and then Nevada and Arizona. Now, New Jersey is the one that we watch most closely, uh, tends to be something of a bellwether state, and we look to see how the New Jersey results look compared to the New York results. They both use the same passing score of 266. So we don't have those statistics yet. I expect them in the next week or so, but that should be interesting. Michigan's a bit of an outlier because they use their own test. It's uh, state-specific. They do use the multi-state exam, uh, but they write their own essays, and so it's very hard to equate that with other states. Uh, but obviously, it's a pretty big state, and there's a lot going on. When we get to Nevada and Arizona, we're talking about two states that have some pretty high passing uh, requirements. Arizona requires a 270 Three, which is a pretty big number as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it looks like we did pretty well in uh, all those jurisdictions, New Jersey, Nevada, and Arizona. So I'm hopeful that we'll have some uh, interviews to share with you and we'll have some numbers for you. Um, now that they've released results, we'll look for the uh, statistics to come out uh, early in the week. So where are we now in the season of our results? Well, two of the big jurisdictions that we're waiting for now are Georgia and California. I would expect Georgia at any time. They don't necessarily set a date, uh, but I would expect mid-May to be about right for them. And as I said, California will come out uh, Friday, May 17th, 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, that's always an interesting time. It's the largest bar exam in the country. It is the hardest or second hardest, certainly, uh, in terms of passing score that's required. Uh, so there's usually a fair amount of information and a fair amount of attention given to California. And that tends to wrap up the bar season for the most part. There are a few jurisdictions that may uh, come in near the end of May, but generally speaking, now we've seen most of the information. Now, I, I've done uh, some uh, podcast episodes about the bar statistics nationally, because we do have some of those national numbers, not the state-by-state the -state numbers. And if you're interested in checking that out, it's episode 250. Uh, it's a bonus episode that we did with New York and Texas results, and then talking about the uh, exam generally across the country. So we'll put a link in the show notes to that episode, but you might want to check that one out as well. If you're getting ready to sit for the July 2019 exam, I do want to say the time is counting down and you don't have much time. And if it turns out that you're one of these students in New Jersey or Nevada or Arizona or coming up in, in Georgia or California, uh, you're not going to have much time to make a decision if you did not pass the exam. So I encourage you to kind of get yourself set mentally, do your homework, clear the decks, uh, do the dil due diligence that you need if you're thinking about switching to a different course or a different approach to study. And then once you get your results, you're going to have to jump on it pretty quickly. I would say that about uh, typically the 18th to the 20th of May uh, starts to be the time frame when it really, it's still manageable. Beyond that, it's going to get pretty tough to do anything except study full time. So you want to be aware of that. Well, I hope that gives you some sense of where we are in the season. There's obviously a lot going on. February 2019 results finishing up. July 2019 bar takers really starting to gear up and, and work uh, in earnest. And we wanted to share this uh, interview uh, with a successful Florida student because um, I think it's a great inspiration in terms of what it's like when you're already licensed and you've got to come back and study after many years. And I don't think that that's an easy thing to do by any stretch of the imagination. So I think the accomplishment of passing the Florida bar, which is one of the toughest in the country, on his first try is a really terrific thing. And I thought you'd really enjoy this uh, conversation I had uh, with Brian. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Hanging Out with Successful Bar Exam takers, and I have one of my really favorite students from the last couple of years, uh, Brian Montague is with us today. And Brian, you're talking to us from the Panhandle in Florida, correct? Correct. Yeah, and you are uh, a passing Florida bar taker, first try in February 2019. Correct. Yeah, and that's the least number of words I've ever heard out of your mouth, ever. <laughs> well, it won't last. Okay, good. Um, We've had a we've had quite a role, you and I, um, and and uh, sort of working through this process. And it's been an interesting journey. It's had some some obviously some high points, but some low points too. Some very difficult times. And I'm really anxious and appreciate you being willing to tell your story today, 
because I know that a lot of people uh, like you, you're a licensed attorney in Mississippi, right? And um, yes. there are a lot of people who come from other jurisdictions to take the Florida bar and they've got a variety of things going on in their lives. They've got a practice, they've got family, they've got other obligations and it's a challenging process. And you really felt the full weight of that challenge as you studied and you persevered through it. And so I'm just excited to have you here. So uh, that's more talking than I should do. I wanna turn it over to you and just ask you to sort of share with our audience a little bit of your backstory and your history and how you came to be taking the Florida Bar. Well, um, I will try to keep it uh, a little brief, but at the same time, uh, tell my stories you asked me to do. Um, I've been practicing in Mississippi for almost 35 years, and uh, I had not thought back upon the fact until completing the Florida Bar Examination that during that time, I interrupted my practice four times. Uh, once when I left my father's firm uh, to become a solo practitioner, once when I was called military active duty in 2004, a third time when I was called active duty to go to Iraq in 2009, and then the fourth time was when my wife and I, after uh, we had lost uh, my parents uh, at separate times in 2013, and for other reasons, we had always aspired to come to Florida. So we did. We came down here a few years ago, and um, it was, and as you remember from spending time in this area yourself, it's a, just a beautiful part of the world. Even though I told somebody the other day, I said, uh, if anybody ask how it is in Northwest Florida, tell them it's horrible. <laughs> yeah, stay out. <laughs> yeah, stay out. Come visit, but just don't stay. Any case, so so that was those were the four interruptions. And incident to the last one, um, I thought that, and my wife uh, thought that it would be good to try to remain productive. And I still represent Mississippi clients here and there, but it just seemed like a natural segue to try to uh, augment that with Florida activity. So that's what inspired me to take the bar at age 60. Yeah. Which I and th 35 years from a first bar exam is a really challenging task. I mean, just getting back into the study. And you originally enrolled with us to take the bar and we had a great conversation. And sometime shortly after that, you contacted me because there was a crisis in your family, right? Yes, that is correct. I, uh, my father raised three sons, all of whom became lawyers. He used to characterize it as a genetic defect. <laughs> uh, but in any case, we did. And um, my the middle of the three I was, uh, Dixon Montague was a uh, highly accomplished lawyer with Vincent Elkins in Houston, in fact, he at one time had attained the largest eminent domain verdict in Texas state eminent domain jurisprudence history. And uh, he was uh, just really an outstanding lawyer with that firm. And uh, he, we lost him to glioblastoma uh, last year in 2018. And that was, that was challenging. He and I were close and, but, but I was, as I had mentioned to you a number of times, he was, Absolutely, uh, as was our father, by the way, whose story is also worth recounting. But uh, Dixon was absolutely tenacious, a, a highly skilled trial lawyer. And dad uh, was the same. He he uh, contract dad contracted polio six months before the salt vaccine was became commercially available. He, prior to which, he was a cross country athlete and worked as a field engineer in Midland, Texas, but. After that, he had a law degree in his hip pocket. He used it to return to Mississippi and became a very uh, well-respected, uh, ethical, committed, uh, small town lawyer. And, and both of those, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to share this, but both of those, the, the memories of both my brother and my father uh, were true sources of inspiration as I went through the grind of studying for this bar exam. Yeah. And, and I, 
it's a testimony to their memory that you did a great deal of this, I think, very cognizant and very aware of the legacy that they had created for you. And when you had first contacted me, you'd started your studies and then your brother's diagnosis became more dire and you made the conscious decision at that point that that was going to come first and you were going to, to set aside studying for the bar even though you were just beginning to get a, a little bit of momentum and it felt like, oh, you know, you're ready to do it. And I thought that it was a, not only a kind thing for your family, but it was a very selfless act on your part because it takes a lot of momentum to get started when you're doing something like studying for this big test and you're just trying to get going and suddenly you stop. And the question then in our minds typically is going to be, well, we'll, you know, will that student come back? Will they be able to uh, return and start this process again? And you did. And you came back to the study. Um, you know, certainly, uh, I, know it was, I know you were saddened, and, but I also know that um, there was this sense of purpose in what you were doing. Um, you didn't have to become a lawyer in Florida. You have a very successful practice in Mississippi. You are well-respected. Um, and uh, I think this is an interesting point because sometimes people think that uh, bar takers are all desperate. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you're doing it because it's just the next thing to do. But sometimes you do it because there's really a bigger purpose out there. And, and that was pretty evident with you from the beginning, Brian. Um, so we, we come to this point where you're now saying, all right, I am now here and ready to study. And you really threw yourself into your studies once you began, didn't you? Yeah, I did. And I would be the first to say that compared to the challenges confronted by a lot of celebration bar review students, I had the relative luxury of, uh, I mean, I, I still did represented clients uh, here and there, but I had, uh, the luxury of virtually uninterrupted opportunity to, to study. And I used every bit of it, and I'm glad I did. Yeah. Um, when, when you started the process, uh, it was challenging for you to get back into the thought of studying. And I know it was unsettling a little bit, wasn't it, to be out of your comfort zone and having to do different things. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. And, and uh, I think a lot of people in my shoes who have gone through your course could probably tell similar stories of how uh, aggravating it is to hear your neighbors and friends say, well, why do you have to study for the bar? I mean, you've been practicing all your adult life and I just want to choke <laughs> and yeah. say, it's not quite like that. Uh, right. But uh, in any case, yeah, I was committed to it. Um, you were studying, really, you, you took your bar study like it was a regular job. You were working on it every day, and you had a very uh, disciplined approach to the study. In fact, one of the more disciplined students I thought we had in terms of just following through and doing all of the assignments. What, what would you say for you was the most challenging part of getting back into the study after that many years? Um, resolving to uh, develop a routine and then once you develop it adhering to it and uh but those however simple those two steps sound they're were for me incredibly important and once i executed those things uh and use your study guide which i followed uh to the letter uh everything everything worked out yeah um and, and one of the, the big challenges, I think one of the interesting things for me, uh, you, you enrolled in the personal coaching plan. So you and I talked about your writing. Sometimes we yelled about your writing. Sometimes we you know, came to, to virtual fisticuffs uh, over it. Uh, because part of what we were trying to do was to, to change some of what you were used to doing and then also getting you comfortable with some of the things that were natural skills, but which you had really sort of sublimated and put away in order to do, you know, what you thought you were supposed to do in, in the writing. And I want to talk a little bit about that because I think sometimes you, people can get the impression that it's all sweetness and light, easy, and, you know, everything goes smoothly. But for you, learning to write in the style that we were asking was a major, major challenge, wasn't it? Uh, true. And, you know, um, when you have been practicing for a long time, uh, a practice which included writing a lot of briefs. 
the instinct is to say, well, you know what, why do I need somebody to tell me how to write? Because I've been doing it all of my adult life. And as you implied, I resisted. I was not immediately convinced of the uh, merit of the FLA writing style. Um, but I became convinced. And uh, I became convinced when I tried, as you were alluding to, to uh, compare my old writing, uh, even research memo writing styles with the FLA style. And I was convinced in speaking with you and in trying my method that uh, FLA really works and it flows beautifully and it really is conducive to uh, putting your thoughts and, and uh, analysis down on paper. Yeah, and, and for those that don't know, what, what Brian's referring to is we use a writing style called Fact Law Application, or FLA. And as we started out in the course, and, and you struggled with it, as most people do, because it is different than certainly IRAC, issue rule application, conclusion writing, or brief writing, or some other things that you might do in practice, you had an interesting approach, which was that you had sort of this hybrid that you had developed out of all of these different pieces, and, and from my standpoint as a teacher, it was really an interesting opportunity because I have a great deal of respect for you and for your, your expertise and your ability. And I did something that I don't always do or don't often do with a student, which was to say, okay, why don't you go ahead and try your writing style, write some essays the way that you think they should be, and then let's look at them and compare them to the FLA writing style. And my sense was if, if Brian could see what he's doing and put it up against this other writing style, I think he'll believe at the end that this is the right way to go, but I'm, I trusted you enough to believe that you would find the right piece for you. And so we went that direction and you were gracious enough to go ahead and try. It was a lot of extra work, frankly, for you uh, to do this extra writing, but you did it. And, and what was that like for you to, to sort of do your writing and then compare it and, and go back and forth for a while? Speak, seeming to speak from a script here, but I can truthfully say that um, when I tried my old method, which was a method I learned in law school decades ago, facts, issues, conclusions, legal reasoning. And so I said, you know, that's the way I'm used to writing. Let me try that. And uh, as you just mentioned, we tried uh, the same essay using that format and then using FLA. And more and more, I became very, uh, not only used to, but convinced of the merit of FLA. And uh, it's just it's something that I'm now a fervent con convert for. Yeah. And, and you passed the, the exam first try, and you passed both sections, Florida and the, the multi-state. So it wasn't that there was a deficit, of, of course, of, in any part. Um, I, what would you say to somebody who is going through that struggle of trying to learn how to write differently than they did in law school, based on your experience, how would you help them make the transition? First, I hope they make it more easily than I did. Uh, and if they're not as uh, stubborn as I am, they probably will. Uh, second, um, <laughs> it sounds like an infomercial maybe, but, but all I can say is uh, try it, it works. And um, it is, it is an approach to writing that uh, makes putting your thoughts down, comparing arguments weaker versus stronger, and assessing the stronger argument and explaining why the stronger argument works is perfectly suited to that dynamic. And uh, the examiner must have uh, liked it enough to pass me. So, yeah, I think so. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. I think people will, will appreciate that it's hard to do at first and it takes some time. As you got more comfortable with the writing style, your writing clearly got stronger and stronger. You were able to focus more on the substance, the law behind it. Um, and, and really, by the end of the, the practice period, you were turning out very successful essays very consistently and, and really getting in and delving into the, the underlying law. And of course, there, there's some very unique state-specific material in Florida. I mean, there's, there's Florida Constitution and there's Florida uh, trusts and there's Florida domestic relations. And I mean, there, there's a lot there. And I think at moments there, you were probably thinking to yourself, what have I done to myself? Why am I you know, digging into all of this, right? Yeah, yeah, no, but it was, you know, one of the first conversations you and I had was one where I was not fully 
uh, on board with the uh, grind of studying for the Florida bar. But I, one of the other reasons I wanted to do it is just for the, the uh, academic exercise. And I learned a lot. I don't know how much of it I'll retain. I hope some, but uh, I learned a lot. And that was one of the reasons I did it. Yeah, and I really, I thought that of, of all the students that I worked with in the last term, you might have been the one that was most interested in the academic substantive material. We had some great conversations that were probably off book, I mean, where we went deeper on some things. But the joy of just learning, uh, which I think is a really wonderful thing. I mean, sometimes, you know, you're young relative to me, um, but it, it's a very frustrating thing sometimes when people look at people of a certain age and they assume that, that our brains have atrophied and that we're no longer capable of rational, unique thought or deeper thought or even an opinion, much less a seat at the better tables along 30A. Uh, but the, uh, the reality is that, that I thought you really enjoyed that part of the process. And I think for a lot of practitioners, sometimes it's just a real pleasure to get out of the grind of daily practice and be able to actually think about the law and think about some concepts. And you had some great insights about, you know, why do you do these things? And I, I, I'd be like, dang, I don't really know. <laughs> you know. I'm not really sure why we do it that way, because that's what we do, right? So th I think that was really a, 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 an interesting part of the work. What about the, the multi-state exam? What did that feel like to you coming back and, and studying for that? Um, well, uh, the one thing that I come away from that part of the effort committed or very certain of is that repetition is, at least for me, was the key. The more multiple choice practice questions I went over, the better I got. And um, I think on that part of the Florida exam, I ended up uh, with a 150, which isn't bad. Great score, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's not uh, record breaking by any stretch, but it's, I, I, I think it's as high as I ever scored in a practice uh, situation. And I think that the practice exams were pivotal to my being comfortable with that part of it. Yeah. Uh, and I think that you, you took the, the practice part really seriously. You worked at it. Um, what kind of note taking did you do on multi-states? Did you use mind maps or were you just taking notes? Uh, uh, both. I, I took my notes in mind map format. I ended up using a feature of mind map that allows you to, to convert the dynamic, uh, the mind map to conventional linear format. Right. And I remember that. Yeah. And it was really interesting. We hadn't seen anybody do that before and you, you did it. And why, why was that helpful for you? Uh, it's, it was just a format I was used to. I ended up making a 26 or however many tab uh, notebook, three ring binder notebook. I studied in the last uh, week or two before the exam, I studied exclusively from the notebook that I had created and I did something else that uh, you had recommended to your students, and that is to record from your from your mind map products or whatever products they create. And so, uh, driving down to Tampa from here, and while I was in Tampa, I ended up listening to my recordings on my cell phone, and that was very, that was honestly that was very effective. So um, I commend you for the tools that you offer to students that helps us learn. And it's yeah, I really, yeah, I really like mind maps. I think they're a great way to take notes. And I was really excited when you discovered this technique in MindMeister, I think it was, the, the software, where you could literally take the, the notes and convert them into something that makes sense for you. And I thought that that was, um, as we've been working with mind maps over the last few years, it's been interesting to see how that's developed. And I thought you actually kind of expanded our view of how a mind map could be presented and worked through. So that was exciting to, to see. And I knew you were working it and, and dealing with it and, and really engaged with the material uh, in a deeper way than, than typically we do when we just take notes, right? And, and then they, the notes disappear, They're, they go up into ether. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I use my notes extensively. And like I say, for the last uh, probably couple of weeks before the exam, that was my, except for multiple choice, which I continue to, do practice exams uh, concerning. But except for that, uh, my go-to 
resources were A, my outline that I prepared in my uh, audio recordings of my outlines. That's great. Now, you also participated in the group coaching calls that we did, in addition to working with me uh, in personal coaching. Can you talk a little bit about what group coaching meant to you? Yeah, I thought that's a, that's a great format. First of all, it's easy to use. Um, Kelly, who was my group coaching, group coaching mentor, was wonderful. She was very uh, engaging. She invited uh, conversations and exchanges. And, um, you know, there are not too many, for better or worse, there are not too many 60-year-olds taking the bar exam. But there's, there, there are some, and it was interesting to compare experiences with people, uh, in our case, all over the planet. Gentleman from Saudi Arabia, another from uh, Africa, if I recall correctly. In any case, it was, yeah. it was a international group. And, and I must say, speaking of international, uh, how impressed I was with the, the students who were not native English speakers, who a overcame that and still succeeded. That's quite inspirational. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I think the group coaching is one of the great things that we uh, get to, to do because it, it helps you feel less isolated. Um, and, and certainly you get to share your expertise and get the expertise of other people. Kelly Kildam, uh, that, that you're referring to, one of our, our staff members, the, the uh, head of our group coaching program, we've got some other group coaches. And of course, they get very invested and uh, in, in the uh, results. And when the results came out in Florida, Kelly was just beside herself, jumping up and down for you. She was so excited. Uh, so that, that was a great thing. So, um, so you, you got to Tampa to take the exam. Uh, it's been a while since you've been in a bar exam, obviously. Um, and I know you had lots of questions about how's the process going to work and what do they let me bring in and what can I do and what, you know, lots of the logistics kinds of things. Talk a little bit, if you would, about what the Florida bar is like, because um, I think sometimes people think I exaggerate about it, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, well, no, you don't. It, uh, and, you know, I was, as I was overwhelmed by the humanity in February 2019, I, I learned that the size of the crowd of which I was a part is uh, a lot smaller than the July uh, taking crowd, which surprised me. I think, if memory serves me, I was one of about 1,700 uh, bar takers in February, something like That's that. That's right, 1,700, yeah. Um, and um, it was... Very well run, in my opinion. The only criticism I have is that as the, as the uh, exam takers are filing through the matrix of, uh, of uh, what do you call them, uh, scanners, the uh, metal detectors. Right. Uh, you know, after you do that, they herd you like cattle into this very compressed area outside the examination room and you were just jammed in there like sardines. And that was not very fun, but as soon as they <laughs> released us into the cavernous room, it was very liberating. And so we all scurried to our tables and they, uh, we were, you know, this room was what, maybe as big as three football fields. And we we're each sitting there two to a table with our exam numbers where we're supposed to be seated. And it was very well marked. I will say this, um, they didn't tell us until the night before, oh, be sure you have an extension cord that's at least eight feet long. Well, thankfully, I had bought one. I don't know why I thought to do this, but I did. I had bought one just the, the day before, but for which I would have really been in a pickle. Uh, the distance from the plugins to the laptops takes every inch of an eight-foot cord. I had... 16 feet or something. But, but my point is simply that if I had to say to future takers what to be sure to do, be sure you bring a long extension cord. Um, as far as the uh, logistics, I thought it was uh, very professionally run. If you had questions about uh, technology, I had one hiccup trying to get started with uh, the exam portion that first morning. They had the... Uh, Whoever supplies the platform on which you take the essay. Yeah, the example. I, yeah. Thank you. They had all their representatives there. As soon as you raise your hand, they'd come to you. 
help you. And they had, uh, of course, they had tons of monitors who were there both to help you and to watch you. And, yeah. uh, and uh, it was, I, I thought it was uh, as good an atmosphere as you could hope for under those circumstances. That's great. Well, I, I, I want to hear, I mean, you come back from the exam and of course you go back to your life and you've got plenty to do. So it doesn't take real long to get uh, Florida results back about six weeks after the exam. So what's it like waiting to get results and, and results day itself? Well, you know, um, I must say that after I took the exam, I was uh, relatively confident that I had passed. I, I felt that way. And then over the, <laughs> over the weeks between then and, and receiving the results, I said, hey, you know, maybe I didn't. Maybe, I, maybe there's something I missed. And um, so I did go through episodes where I began to have doubts. But by the time the results came, I was uh, – I wasn't pleasant. I wasn't surprised, but I was obviously pleased, and uh, and uh, I I say again, I, I really uh, have become a believer in the curriculum that y'all have developed, your team and you have developed, and uh, the merit of following it. It really worked for me. Oh, that's great! I I'm so pleased for you, and I know. For a while, you know, it felt like your life was on hold, right? I mean, so much was going on, so much happening. And I, I know you've heard me talk about the fact that our sort of our, our philosophy here is that I have my life back. And uh, we've made it something of a tradition on these uh, videos uh, to do a Dave Ramsey-like countdown and to ask you to, uh, to share that uh, mantra for other people. So I'm going to embarrass you now and, and make you do that. <laughs> Uh, and, and we're going to count down, uh, you know, three, two, one. And, and I would love you to just as loud or soft as you want uh, to just uh, share with us that you have, I have my life back. Are you okay? Are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay. Ready? Three, two, one. I have my life back. Perfect. <laughs> and, you know, um, and, I want to share one other piece of, of information with Brian about Brian. Uh, Brian is like me, um, uh, afflicted with a disease called the uh, New Orleans Saints football team. Uh, unfortunately, he's got an additional problem, which is that his son, I believe, is a logistics uh, manager for the. I can't even say their names, but those people that play up in, in Georgia. And um, that had to be just excruciating as, as the season was going on and you were studying and your son is with the other team and the season that's happening. And I just, I thought it was very impressive the way you just kept your focus all the way through the season and just kept studying for the let bar. Me, let me say that my, my son, my younger son, Austin, was a logist, seasonal logistics intern with the Sorry, Jackson, with the Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> I grew up bleeding uh, black and gold uh, Saints colors, and, uh, but blood is thicker than water. So once uh, Austin was uh, honored with that position, I became a supporter of everything he was doing. And that's, I must say, uh, that's an impressive organization. They really are. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's fun to be able to sort of re return to all of that and see what's going on. And I thought it was really wonderful the way that you kept your work life family balance through all this. You worked really hard on the bar, but I also, we had conversations about Austin and, and things that were going on with your family. We obviously talked about your brother and your dad. Um, and, you know, I think that um, finding that balance it's a rare person that can hold all of those pieces in uh, good measure at the same time. It's certainly one of the reasons that you're a successful lawyer. Uh, but I was enriched by our, our conversations and our friendship. And I know that our audience is enriched by hearing your stories of what happened on the bar. So often I talk to students who have these great stories in which they failed multiple times and then come back and pass. And that is terrific. But I mm. think sometimes we don't give quite enough credence or credit to the people like you that come in and quietly just go about their work and pass the first time through. The pass rate in Florida is very low. Uh, not a lot of people pass on the first try and not a lot of practicing attorneys from out of state uh, pass on their first try. I mean, it's less than 50%. So this is really quite an accomplishment for you. And I'm sure that, that you uh, enjoy that, but, but also I hope you're, you're proud of the accomplishment because it was not a small thing. Well, I appreciate that, and I thank uh, Kelly, you, 
uh, June, all of you at Celebration Bar. Y'all, y'all do a wonderful job, and I was certainly a beneficiary. Well, thank you. And, um, you know, to our audience, thanks for being with us. I hope you've enjoyed talking with Brian. Um, I can tell you that if you're ever up on 30A and you see a, you know, very uh, successful lawyer strolling along the beach, it's probably this guy. Uh, (laughs) um, Thanks for being with us, Brian. Thank you to all of us in our audience. And we're going to say bye now. Well, that's our uh, episode and interview for today. I hope you enjoyed uh, my conversation with Brian. He's a terrific guy, and uh, I think he took a really uh, dedicated and systematic approach to the work. He bought into the writing style, as you heard, that we taught. Uh, He did the work the way we asked him to do it, and he had great results. And if that sounds interesting to you, then I invite you to join us on Thursday at 7 p.m., a reminder for our free webinar. It's called Do Something Different. Make the next bar exam your last bar exam. And uh, that's exactly what Brian did. You can register by clicking on the button here on the show notes or by going to celebrationbarreview.com forward slash webinar. And then we'll see you Thursday at 7 p.m. All right. Well, good luck to everybody waiting for their Georgia and California results or other states if they're still out there waiting. Uh, We hope that uh, the results are favorable for you. And we will be back to you uh, as soon as we start to get some of those big state results in, as well as uh, another interview and more information in next week's uh, podcast episode. And until then, we'll see you along the extra mile. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers at www.celebrationbarreview.com.